Good morning everyone. I'd like to greet you in the precious name of our Lord and our Saviour Jesus Christ. It certainly is wonderful that we can be gathering together again, in, even in this manner, but it's still good that we can get together and uh, worship the Lord. Uh, this is uh, Sunday, it's the Lord's Day, and uh, beyond that of course, this is a day that the Lord has made and we'll rejoice and we'll be glad in it. And I trust that the Lord will bless you as you have this time uh, together with us. So before we uh, go to the Word, we're going to be uh, singing just two songs this morning. Uh, the one is uh, uh, well known, I'm sure, by you all. Uh, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. And then the second song we'll sing is Beulah Land. Not Beulah Land, I beg your pardon. It's going to be um, Come Thou Fount. <clears throat> I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join this with Jesus as we travel this side. I'm a part of the family, the family of God. You will notice we say brother. family. I'm thankful for the fact that uh, Jesus has saved my soul. I'm sure that you're thankful that he saved you too. And it's wonderful that we can share and rejoice in our Savior. Well, let's just have a word of prayer and commit this time to our Lord, shall we? Let us pray. Our Father, once again, we're thankful that we can be found together, uh, even meeting in a manner such as this. And we're thankful, Father, for your promise that where two or three are gathered together in your name, there you'll be in the midst, and we pray, Lord, that uh, wherever we may be, Father, we pray that each one of us may be mindful of your presence. And uh, as we worship, Father, we pray you'd help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we, we know that we're in an environment now where we perhaps have more distractions around us than normal. So we pray that you'd help us, Lord, to focus uh, our minds and our attention upon thyself. And for this moment in time, Lord, we pray that you'd help us to set aside the cares and the concerns of this life and help us, Lord, to focus our attention upon thee. May we ever be looking to the one who is the author and the finisher of our faith. And we thank you and praise you in his wonderful name. Amen. Well, the next song we're going to sing is the song, Come Thou Fount. Come Thou Fount of every blessing and tune my heart to sing thy grace. Oh, 
Well, I trust that the Lord has blessed you in this uh, past week. I know that these are times where you perhaps have more uh, opportunity to read your Bible, more opportunity to uh, spend time with the Lord in prayer, and I trust that you are taking uh, advantage of these wonderful opportunities that is ours in being able to meet with the Lord in this way. I'd just like to encourage you, uh, particularly the young ones, that at 12 o'clock we will be having our Sunday school lesson and uh, today today that's uh, going to be given by Sister Sue Capelli and that's going to be uh, on the YouTube channel at 12 o'clock and I'll also uh, bring it up onto the Facebook page as well. So that'll be around about 12 o'clock when you'll be able to, to see that. I'm sure that each and every one of you are looking forward to the time when we can get back to normal and be able to uh, be with one another face to face uh, as we worship the Lord. I'm mindful of the words of David when he said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And well, we can't go to the house of the Lord, uh, but today uh, our homes are our chapels and uh, we're able to still gather together and we're thankful that God is going to be with us. And so I trust that God will bless you and encourage you and build you up in this most holy faith. Well, let's just go to the word, shall we? And uh, let's um, be looking to the Lord to encourage us and challenge us at this time. We uh, often sing songs and they have words in it or phrases in it that we aren't always aware as to what the phrase may well mean. And uh, so, for instance, we would sing something like, and for the younger Christian, they may not necessarily understand it, but they'll, we'll sing, um, we're marching to Zion. And of course, that's a great and rousing hymn. And we're able to quite easily connect the dots. We know that it's talking about uh, going to heaven. Sometimes people wonder, uh, what does that phrase Zion mean? Well, of course, you know, the phrase Zion in the word of God uh, is a prophetical and uh, poetic name for Jerusalem. And so when we sing, we're marching to Zion, we aren't talking about going to Jerusalem that's in Israel today. We are looking forward and with anticipation to going to our heavenly home and uh, going to that new Jerusalem. And then we also sing the song, uh, I, I mentioned that we we're going to sing it, but we, we're not, uh, the song um, Beulah Land. And uh, that's a well-known song and a well-loved song as well. And sometimes people may think, well, what does that word actually mean, Beulah? And Beulah, actually, uh, we find it in Isaiah chapter 62, and it tells us, actually, it gives us uh, what the meaning is. It means married. And so when we think about uh, Beulah land, uh, it makes, as well, it, it makes us think about our heavenly home. Uh, it also has the idea of pleasant. And so, you know, to be married, of course, is pleasant and it's a blessing. And we look forward to going to our heavenly home. And in that song, we have the phrase, the zephyrs seem to float to me. And again, that's a phrase that we might think, what does that actually mean? And of course, it's not talking about the motor car zephyr, for those of you who may have had one years gone by. It's talking about the gentle breezes that come uh, across your way. So you get what I'm saying. There's a number of songs that we sing, a number of hymns that we sing, that we love, they're scripturally based and scripturally sound, and we love them, and they're timeless. Uh, but sometimes we have phrases that we don't, we sing them, but we may not necessarily know what the phrase means. Now, we've just sung a well-known and well-loved song, uh, Come Thou Fount. And in the, the midst of that song, we have that phrase, Here I raise mine Ebenezer. And some might be thinking, well, it sounds great, but I don't really know what that means. Well, that's what I like to speak to you about this morning. Uh, Here I raise mine Ebenezer. It's a biblical phrase, and it's a phrase that is found in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 7. And in verse 12 of that chapter, the Bible says that Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shin, and call the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. So you'd like to take your Bibles and uh, turn to, second, uh, to 1 Samuel and look at chapter 7 
and we'll read together the first 12 verses. First Samuel, reading from verse 1 down to verse 12. And the men of Kirjath Jerem came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified Eliezer his son to keep the ark of the Lord. And it came to pass while the ark abode in Kirjath Jerem that the time was long, for it was twenty years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, if you do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you and prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth and serve the Lord only. And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. And they gathered together to Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mizpah. And when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together to Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. And Samuel took a sucking lamb and offered it for a burnt offering holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel, for the Lord heard him. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered, with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomforted them, and they were smitten before Israel. And the men of Israel went out to Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and smote them until they came unto Bethcar. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shen and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. And verse 13 says, And the Philistines were subdued, and they came no more into the coast of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Now in our day and age, it's not unusual for us to set up uh, markers and plaques uh, to commemorate things that have happened uh, in our past. They are of historical value to us and so you may see a building or a statue that is commemorating a, a great event that has taken past in the past. And uh, I think in time to come there will be memorials set up for the NHS and for the great work that they have done and are continuing to do at this time. And I do think and believe that that would be a fitting thing to do for our NHS. Down through history, we have uh, honoured sacrifice and we have praised commitment with markers and with plaques. And oftentimes you read the Word of God and you, you come across uh, the use of memorials, something that they would have erected that stood as a, uh, a testimony, as a memorial to the faithfulness of God. So let me remind you of a few. In, in Genesis chapter 28, we see Jacob taking the stones that he had used for a pillow and set it up as a pillar. <laughs> so we get confused between the pillow and pillar, but he set up, he made a pillar, and then he called the place Bethel, uh, which means the house of God. And in Joshua chapter 4, we find as to how uh, God led the children of, of Israel over Jordan and they were commanded to set up two memorials of course God had uh, parted the way so that he had stemmed the water so that he could they could pass over similar like the Red Sea so the the water stood up as like a bank on the one side and they were able to walk across uh, but what they were to do they were to take 12 stones 
and they were to erect 12 stones in the middle of the river of Jordan. And then they were to take another 12 stones and all of these stones were taken from the, the river itself and they would take it up on the other side of the bank and they were to there erect a, another pillar. And of course, when the river Jordan once again was allowed to flow, the, 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 the memorial that was in the river would not be seen by man, but it would certainly be seen by God. And the memorial that was erected on the other side of the river Jordan was there as a testimony to the faithfulness of God. And when we read in our text in 1 Samuel chapter 7 that we find a similar thing that Samuel took the stone and he set it between Mizpah and Shen and he called the name of it Ebenezer saying that uh, hitherto hath the Lord helped us. So Mizpah was the place where they had gathered together and Shen it means a tooth or a sharp ragged kind of cliff. So these are two locations we aren't entirely certain as to where they are today but Mizpah was where they were gathered and Shen was this place that kind of looked like a, a jagged tooth or a rock out cast type of thing. And between these two places, Samuel set up this memorial stone and he called it Ebenezer. So when we sing together, here I raise mine Ebenezer, we are speaking of a memorial that has been set up. And it's an instructive thing when we think about this memorial, this Ebenezer that has been set up. And I hope it'll be instructive for you and I that even today that we would uh, raise our own Ebenezers, uh, so to speak, and able to say, hitherto hath the Lord helped us. But then, let me give you a little bit of a background, if you like, to the leading up to the establishing of this particular memorial. The chapters that we find before chapter 7 are very interesting. I'd encourage you to read them. In chapter 4, we read as to how the Ark of God had been taken by the Philistines. In chapter 5, we read as to how the Ark of God was placed into the house of Dagon, Dagon the false god. And of course, interesting to see as to how this false god kept on falling down before the Ark of God. It was reduced to no more than a stump. And also the men of Ashdod were cursed. And so they realized, you know, the Ark of God was something that was really something they didn't want within their coast. It was too hot to handle. And so they placed the Ark on a new cart and they sent it on the way to uh, Beshemite. And there we find actually that some men looked into the Ark of God and that day there were 50,000 people that were slain because they had the presumption to look into the Ark of the Covenant. And that must have, that must have been a, a tremendously fearful thing. Just think about when we went into lockdown in England on the 23rd of March, there were some 335 people that had died from coronavirus. 335. Here we have an instance where 50,000 people were slain at one time. So you can imagine the fear that it must have struck into the hearts of people. And we come to chapter 7 and we find that the ark is brought to Kirjath Jerim. Now for a long time the Israelites had been under the oppression of the Philistines uh, as a nation the nation of Israel had sinned against God and they were worshipping false gods. But you know, as it is with all sin, they were unhappy in their sin. You know, there may be pleasure in sin, but it only lasts for a season, just for a short period of time. And then it's, you know, we find that the way of transgressors is hard. And there's pleasure in sin for a season, but afterwards there's suffering and there's, and there's death. And so Israel had found that the pleasures of sin are short-lived. And they were most happy, unhappy, and they were most miserable because of their sin. And verse 2 tells us that they lamented after the Lord. They were a people that uh, 
were, were grieved uh, because of their sin and the consequences of sin. Sometimes we realize the seriousness of sin because of the consequence. And that's how it was with the people of Israel. So let's think about a few things with the stone. The stone was firstly set up because Israel repented from sin. For 20 long years, the Ark of the Covenant was not in the tabernacle. Presumption, unbelief, wickedness resulted in the Ark being captured. And the condition of the people right now was that they had sinned and they were now in a place where, where they were actually even worshipping false gods. And the call of Samuel was quite simple. The call of Samuel was that they would return unto the Lord. Turn from your sin. Turn back to God. They were a backslidden people. And the call was for them to repent. The Ark of the Covenant had been taken because of their wickedness and because of their sinfulness and their backslidden condition. The Ark of the Covenant was a symbol of the presence of God with them. And when the Ark had been taken, it was a symbol that the, God, the presence of God had not been removed from them. We know that when the Ark was captured, Eli, he fell down, he broke his neck and he died. And his daughter-in-law, who was pregnant at that time, she gave birth to a son. And the name that she gave to her son was Ichabod. And Ichabod means the glory has departed. So if Israel had been right with God, the Ark of the Covenant would never have been taken. And they were now in a place where they were courting and committing all sorts of uh, idolatry and wicked acts. They were out of fellowship with God. And this reminds us that when we get out of fellowship with God, we live in a condition where God just cannot bless us. When we're out of step with God, when we're in step with the world, when we're going the way that the world wants us to go and we're embracing all sorts of sin, well, God kind of takes his hand off us for a moment. We know that as believers, he'll never leave us in that sense, but, you know, he will leave us to our own devices. It will go our course, but it will be such a miserable way that we take. Today, we live in a world that is reeling under the effects of the coronavirus. And we can liken the coronavirus to sin. It's affected everybody. It's affected people that live on the street from a pauper to a prince, quite literally. From a pauper to a prime minister, it has affected absolutely everybody. Anybody can fall foul to this terrible disease. And that reminds us just how it is with sin. Sin isn't just the misfortune of a select few people. It is something that has absolutely affected every single one of us. We all reel under the curse and the consequences of sin. And if ever there was a time when we as a people and we as a nation would turn and repent and get back to God, then surely the time is now. We live in a time where we have normalized sin, where we call it by names that are perhaps more palatable, more acceptable. But we have uh, addressed sin in a way where we make it something that is uh, well sought after even. We've perverted family life. We kill the innocent with abortions each and every day. We live in a time where people are saying there is no God. And even as Christians, we've gotten to the place where we don't hold the time of, pray of prayer as being something that we need to do every day. We have forsaken the place of prayer and our Bibles are gathering dust on the bookshelf. And we've treat the church even with a sense of contempt. I'll go when and if I feel like it. And now, like everybody else, we're locked in. And we can't go to church even if we wanted to. Maybe there should be a time of national 
and personal repentance. I'm glad to hear that on Monday, I believe it is, that the Prime Minister will be returning to work, I guess, on a limited basis, but nevertheless returning to work um, and going back to his duties. It would be a good thing if he addressed the uh, nation of England in uh, sackcloth and ashes. Repentant, we have sinned and we have invited judgment upon us. The nation of Israel had sinned and they had borne the terrible consequences of their sin. But we read, even though there was this terrible consequence, verse 2 says that they lamented after the Lord. They groaned after the Lord. There was a desire to get right with God. They were miserable and they were a most unhappy people because they had gotten away from God. If you've gotten away from God, your life will be miserable and your life will be unhappy. And the only answer is to repent and come back to the place of blessing. And in verse 3, we see that Samuel tells them to return unto the Lord with all of their hearts. And they were to put away the strange gods. And they were to prepare their hearts unto the Lord and to serve him only. And then God would deliver them. He was telling them, get right, repent, and come back to the place of blessing. And in verse 4, we see their response. That the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth and serve the Lord only. They were a broken hearted people. And they fell before God in repentance. So I want you to think this morning that the stone that had been set up, this Ebenezer stone, it had been set up firstly because the people of God had got to the place where they had repented. They turned back to God and God healed their backsliding. Have you turned away from God? Maybe you've been enticed by the world and by all sorts of enticements that the world has to offer. Maybe the time is today where you return, where you repent, and God heals your backsliding and he restores you once again to the place of blessing. In the words of the songwriter, he said this, he said, I've wandered far away from God now I'm coming home. The path of sin, too long I've trod. Lord, I'm coming home. Maybe it's time to come home. If you come home, you can raise your Ebenezer. Have it as a memorial. I repented. And this was the time, this was the moment, this was the circumstance. And I've set it up here as a memorial, figuratively speaking, as to how God hath helped me. Secondly, I'd like you to notice, not only was the stone set up because of their repentance, but the stone was set up because of revival. Now, their repentance was followed by revival, and that's always how it is. There cannot be revival if there's no repentance. Repentance is the prerequisite to any revival. And as you continue reading, you see that there were certain things that happened. I'd like you to notice that firstly, the people were moved. God was working in their lives. And this wasn't just an, an emotional, being caught up in the moment type of thing. They were moved to change. They had sinned and they had repented. And because they had repented, there was a wonderful change that had wrought in their life. They put away this false gods and they served the Lord only. And so because of this change, we see that there was this wonderful revival. And verse 6 is an interesting verse because it describes how, how seriously they were taking their spiritual matters. <coughs> Excuse me. He, uh, we, we read as to how they, they drew water and they poured it out unto the Lord from a bucket. And the idea that we have from that, 
because we might think that's a strange thing but it's almost as if they're saying we don't have tears enough to fill up a bucket and so in a ceremonial way we're drawing out water and we're pouring it out to the Lord and it symbolizes the tears that they have shed for their sin they were taking spiritual matters serious now and we also read in that same verse that they fasted on that day that's an interesting thing you know up until this time they were guilty of putting the physical before the spiritual they just lived for the pleasures that life had to offer them but now that they had repented and now that God was sending revival we see that now the reverse is true now they're putting the spiritual before the physical and then we see in verse 8 that there was a renewal to prayer where we read that the children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. So you can see that in this revival, that God was moving in their lives, and the things of God had now become a priority. The things that they hadn't thought about before. The things that they cared less, couldn't care less about now, they were recognizing were so important. And when revival comes, when we repent, and when revival comes, understand this, that God is going to work and he's going to move in our hearts and in our lives, and there will be a change. We'll view the place of prayer differently. We'll love to go there, to meet with our God. We'll love to go to the Word of God, to read what God has to say in His Word. We will seek to honor Him. We'll love the Lord our God with all of our hearts and all of our minds and all of our souls. And we look forward to the day when we're able to gather together in our churches. And I trust that you're looking forward to that. And that with a renewed vigor that you go to the house of God rejoicing that you're able to meet together publicly with your brothers and sisters. Oh, there'll be a, a wonderful gathering, I'm sure, when we are able to go back to church. But may we continue on that. And may Sunday and the house of God become important to us. They experience revival. Revival speaks about a, an awakening. It speaks about a renewal. It speaks about a restoration that they were experiencing. The people of God were moved. The second thing I'd like you to notice in this revival is that the power of God was manifested. The people of God were moved and God's power was seen for all to see. We read in verse 10 <clears throat> that Samuel offered unto the Lord a burnt offering and the Philistines draw near to battle against Israel and the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines, discomfited them and they were smitten before Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah, pursued the Philistines, and smote them until they come to Bethkar. In the very place that they had been defeated many years before, now the power of God was on display, and it could be seen for all, and now where they once had defeat, they were enjoying victory. They were experience, experiencing a divine visitation and intervention God's power was on display for all to see and the Israel the Philistines fled that day because of fear so we see that this uh, Ebenezer stone was set up because of God's people repenting it was set up because of God's people experiencing revival and then lastly this morning, the stone was set up so that they could remember. Look at verse 12 again. The Bible says that Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shen, called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. So he took a stone. We don't think it was necessarily a, a very elaborate stone. It was a, a huge stone, a big stone, you could say, but it was just an ordinary stone, and he called it Ebenezer, the stone of help. And he uh, have carved on that stone 
the wonderful title Ebenezer. Ebenezer, the stone of help. Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. And this memorial stone, this stone of remembrance, was a stone that would serve two purposes. Firstly, it would remind them of God's goodness. Every time they would see that stone, walk past Mizpah and Shen and see the stone that Samuel had erected there, every time they see it, they would think to themselves, you know, God helped us when we needed him the most. Maybe today you're able to say, God is helping me when I need him the most. You might be going through a very difficult time. You know, there's all sorts of emotions that are going through uh, that we're having to deal with today. And maybe you're having to deal with uh, a new set of problems. Maybe even uh, depression has started to sink into your life as you have for a prolonged period of time been curtailed in what you've normally been able to do, to do. But wherever you may be today and whatever you may be going through, may you recognize that God has helped. And you can set up a stone of memorial. Ebenezer speaks about the goodness of God. Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. It also reminds us of God's greatness because it is God that's helped us. You know, we've often come to the end of our abilities. We get to the, the end of what we can think or what we can do. We get to the place where we're quite frankly hopeless. But God, he never slumbers or sleep and he is never wanting for power. And so we're able to say that my help doesn't come from anyone other than my great God. Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. Speaks about his goodness and it speaks about his greatness. May the Lord encourage you today just to remind yourself of the goodness of God and the greatness of God as you set up a stone of memorial. So this stone that they set up, this Ebenezer, it was a memorial to these three great truths in their lives. That there was repentance and there was revival and it was a time of remembrance of all that God had done and all that God is. Now I'm not suggesting that after the service today you dig up your garden and you, you put up a, a great big stone in your garden and inscribe the word Ebenezer. I'm not saying that's what you need to do. Um, but I think in our lives we can have a something that will help us just to remember how that God has brought us to himself in repentance and how that is been able to revive us and how that he stands there and it's there as a remembrance and there's certain in my own personal life there are times where I can look back and I can see Ebenezer's if you like I can see how God has wondrously and miraculously worked and I have those Ebenezer's and, and I trust that that you're able to have those Ebenezer's as well as I bring this message to a close now, I don't know your heart, and only God knows your heart. We, we hardly know our own hearts today, but I want you to be certain today that you know Christ as your Savior. If you know and love the Lord Jesus Christ, and you've trusted him to save you, then I rejoice with you in that. But maybe today you've uh, come across this broadcast, and you've been listening, and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You're not sure if you were to die, if you'd go to heaven. Can I just, just briefly share with you a few things? How that you could know for sure that you can become a part of God's family and how that you can be sure of heaven and know the reality of your sins being forgiven. The first thing that I would draw to your attention is the fact that God loves you. You know, the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son 
that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves you. In the book of Second Peter we read that God is not willing that any should perish. So God loves you and his love is without question because we can see the great price that God made in order to reveal the love that he has for you. So understand that God loves you. Also understand that the Bible says that we're all sinners. The Bible says all have sinned and come short to the glory of God. That includes every single one of us. We're all sinners. The Bible also tells us that sin must be paid for. Sin carries a penalty. God is a holy God. God won't sweep our sins under the rug as it were. Sin is always punished. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And the death that he speaks of is not just a physical death, but the fact that we'll be eternally separated from God. But the good news is that Jesus Christ paid the penalty for your sin. All of our sins, all of mankind's sins, were laid upon the Lord Jesus Christ when he went to that cross. The Bible says that he, speaking of God, he hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in, in him. In Romans 5 verse 8 we read that God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the good news that Jesus has paid the penalty for your sin. But then it leaves something that we must do. And what we need to do is we have to repent and we have to call upon the Lord by faith to save us. The Bible says in the book of Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. And in Mark chapter 1 and verse 14 and 15, we read as to how Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. And of course, the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I think that repentance and faith kind of go hand in hand. They are different sides of the same coin. And so we cannot necessarily say what comes first, faith or repentance. But I do believe this is if God is working in a person's heart and life, they'll view sin differently and they'll view God differently. And they'll recognize the wickedness of their sin. And in faith, they will recognize all that Jesus has done for them. How that he was crucified and how that he was buried and how he rose again the third day. Understanding all these things, of course, leads us just quite simply to pray and to receive Christ as our Savior. And we're able to come to him. And the Bible says that, you know, he came unto his own, but his own received him not. But as many as received him. To them gave you the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name. So if you come to him in faith and you call out to him, you'll find wonderful new life. Because new life begins when you trust Jesus as your saviour. So if God's spoken to your heart and, and you recognize that you need to get right with God, then why don't you come to God today? You could pray a prayer, something like this. I'm not saying say the exact same words, but something on, on these lines. You can say, God, I know that I'm a sinner and my sin deserves judgment. And I know that you died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin and that you were buried and that you rose again the third day. I repent of my sins now, Lord, and I ask you to forgive me and to come into life and into my life and to save me and make me a new person. I pray in your name. Amen. Why don't you allow God to have his way in your heart and in your life? And if you've prayed a prayer, something like this, and you would like further help, please don't hesitate to contact me or the church and we'll reach out to you and help you as we can. So may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you by his grace. And I'm reminded of what we read in the, the book of Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. He's able to keep us. May we raise our Ebenezer saying hitherto hath the Lord helped us. 
May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for what we hear and learn. We do pray now that you'd encourage our hearts, Lord. We pray that we take to heart what we've learnt and apply them to our lives. We pray for those who do not know Christ as Saviour, that today would be the day where they place their faith and trust in Jesus. And we'll thank and praise you in his wonderful name.